The Unshackled Waves, episode 213. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Now, as you know, at The Unshackled, we provide in-depth coverage of the Australian Patriot Movement. A lot of it uh, does focus on the street activism and the various uh, publicity stunts pulled by various patriots, but there's one patriot craving a more intellectual grounding to the movement and to pursue activism utilising our existing political system and laws, and that is uh, Christopher Shortus. He's mainly known as a member of the Bendigo Three who are charged and found guilty of offending Muslims by beheading a dummy. The trial was back in 2017. Uh, but of course, there's more to him than that. I had a brief discussion with him on Australia Day, but I thought I'd invite him in the studio for an expanded chat on the show. Chris, welcome. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for bringing me on your show. So I appreciate it. Now, I hope you don't mind me uh, saying you're a bit older than a lot of the, the younger patriots who are probably prominent in the movement. So how long have you been a nationalist and how have you seen Australia change during your lifetime? The short question to the first one is that it's been relatively a short time since I got engaged more politically, if you will. Since December 2014, I got onto Facebook. I actually got involved in a bit of street activism you know, it started really with the Reclaim Australia rallies. That was April 4th, 2015, and it was a bit of a, a real bumpy ride since then. When it comes to nationalism, my political views evolved over that time because obviously me being an advert study of history, I went back to a historical context. And uh, as a nationalist, my centre view for everything that's gone wrong today in our society when you're talking about certain racial discrimination laws indeed the bendigo three which were found guilty of in participation of a video with the intention to incite serious contempt ridicule and revulsion for a class of persons namely muslims and that was section 25-2 of victoria's racial and religious tolerance act and i get back to the fact that the only reason why we have these laws today is because we are a multicultural multiracial society these things did not exist prior to 1975. I remember I, we, we discussed sort of your views on multiculturalism and why it's Australia on Australia Day. I don't want to sort of go too much into that yep. debate. Again, obviously, I agree that in multicultural Australia, that's when we've started to see our freedoms encroach through these various anti-discrimination uh, laws. But uh, I don't think that necessarily that it's cause and effect. But... We'll probably agree to disagree on that one. Yeah, I'm sure that we'll um, disagree on certain uh, views, but you just can't change a historical context. And, I mean, if we were to, uh, you know, let's just go your view, the evidence goes in my favour because instead of saying people, when you come to this country, you must abide by Australian law, and we have certain standards in the way we live. And if you find that offensive, perhaps this is not the place for you to live. We capitulate. And we've been capitulating our culture and our laws, our economics, uh, just bit by bit over the last three decades until we're starting to find hard to identify ourselves. Because the true meaning of multiculturalism is actually duplicity in our laws. Now, obviously, the anti-Islam movement was the sent a course for that because of the complaints that Australians have had regarding halal certification for example and that I as a Christian I can't eat halal certified foods because of what is taught in the text that I follow and when you have big major corporation companies putting into stores such as Coles halal meat and it's not even labeled I'm a consumer and I can't even make a choice that's just a small example of encroachment of Australian law because by the Australian government allowing that to happen they're in a context violating section 116 of the Australian Constitution so I will beat this drum because we've sacrificed our laws and standards to accommodate others who may find our culture already offensive 
Yeah, I certainly agree with that, that it seems a pretty bad deal that to accept multiculturalism, we basically have to give up a whole bunch of our rights and, and values. I mean, yes. that, that doesn't seem like a, a fair deal. It's not, and people need to understand too, we've been successfully, and I don't, I'm not saying it to try and personally offend anyone, but we've been dumbed down and we're not taught the values and the standards and that does come to law, right? And when we talk about, say, something like common law, common law, th that statement in itself is not meant to just for the aristocrats who run the country and the aristocrats that are in power. Common law is there for us, the common people. Right, and if we do not exercise our rights by the knowledge of common law, right, well, I think that's why we're losing. We uh, simply, uh, it is the lack of knowledge that the masses have, and within our patriot movement. And the thing that concerns me at the moment is that there is some voices within the movement. Oh, we can't do it this way. Well, no. For us to have a genuine chance of fighting back, we've got to know what how our system works. And if we actually knew how our system works, and we got together even with our varying views amongst the patriot movement, right? The basic concept of the Australian government under our constitution, that there is no absolute power, right? So the power is divided between the cabinet, the executive, and the judiciary. Now, the cabinet and the executive, you can't do much about unless you enter into politics. But as a mass, if we have knowledge of the law, we have the high court, for example, and the high court can actually rule against government. And, and they do quite frequently. Exactly, exactly. And if we were careful as a group of people to pick out, you know, subjects like pick out particular acts and laws which the states or even local governments have made, you know, and get proper legal advice, and that's the context too, we need to have sound legal advice, we can measure up what our government is doing via the standard of the Constitution. And it's like going to the gym, Tim. If you do not go to the gym and exercise your muscles, you don't... Um, gain strength or power. It is the same with the Constitution because it is not exercised by the masses. The governments actually get away with what they do because people don't know. Yeah, that's certainly true. Now, you mentioned that you began your activism with Reclaim Australia. Yes. What splintered away from Reclaim Australia was the United Patriots Front, which was started by Sherman Burgess. You were one of the, the most uh, prominent members. There was also Blair Cottrell, Neil yeah. Erickson, and Tom Sewell. Uh, obviously, the, the front line of your activism was uh, opposing the, the mosque in Bendigo. Yes. That's obviously what it's most famous for. But how did you all, all sort of convince Verge and, and come together and why was Reclaim Australia not the answer? Um, look, Reclaim Australia, I didn't actually join Reclaim Australia per se. Right? It was just through social media rallies that were organised in every major capital city of Australia on April 4th, 2015. So it was just a social media. It's just that obviously from a Victorian context, you know, it was this, I, I just basically push my way in just say hey look guys I'll be part of this UPF thing because it was more specific to sort of things happening in Victoria obviously the first instance of that was the protest at Richmond against Stephen Jolly at Yarra Valley Council that was an interesting experience and then finally that was the two Bendigo rallies and obviously we did the mock beheading in between those two rallies and uh, the mock beheading was a statement to say that these are the dangers of radical Islam Right, and the fact that there is no Muslims or hardly any Muslims in Bendigo, yet you want to build a mega mosque which is going to be able to hold what two or three thousand worshippers, and you want to build you know the local infrastructure around that, is that you're trying to change the geographics or the demographics of that area by mass migration. Look, from a bigger picture point of view, right, our own governments get involved with wars with the United States in my opinion, Israel in the Middle East, and we actually contribute to the refugee crisis in the first place. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. So we're, we're in a bit of a pickle. But the only thing we have left is, to me, is, is Australian law. And, uh, you know, my involvement with the UPF was because I felt passionate about what was going on with our country. What about the Australian people? I mean, I've been going to university for the last year. You know, I've done one year at university. And every time I get on, a tram at Collins Street, I have to walk past all these homeless people, our own people in Australia, yet we're sen sending hundreds of millions of dollars, for example, was it 300 odd million dollars to Indonesia and they bought attack helicopters with that money, right? We send money to the United Nations, which tries to tell us that our constitution doesn't matter where we should be giving them the bird.
Well, Indonesia does. They, they don't need our money anymore. I mean, exactly. They're, they're, they're a developing uh, country. I mean, they've got an affluent class now. Exactly. I mean, there's another issue too with when it comes to nationalism. There's China, right? Now, I've learnt this because I did international politics as a unit this year at university. And I can tell you something now. There will be still those who are in power that maintain, oh, but, you know, China and India and all that sort of thing, they're developing countries. Well, let me tell you something that China's got that we haven't. It's fast trains. They've got bullet trains. They've got advanced infrastructure, which Australia doesn't have. How can we consider China a developing country, right? And this is, this is the absolute... I shake my head at this, and from a nationalist point of view, right, there is absolutely no need for us not to be, a, say, you know, in quotations, a good global citizen. We can be still that, but we don't have to sacrifice our sovereignty to actually achieve those things. Yeah, going to the fast train thing, oh, where it's t been talked about in Australia for, what, 20, 30 years that we can have fast trains, but the, the problem is our politics is so partisan. One side proposes that the other side is, oh, well, there's all these holes in it. We do it differently. And, uh, yep. the, of course, the worst example was Liberals saying we're going to build the East-West link in Melbourne. Yes. And when Labor gets in there, they tear up the contract. I mean, that's pretty much sums up why our infrastructure is so bad. Yeah, and we pay $1.1 .1 billion for a uh, piece of infrastructure we're never going to have, thanks to Dan Andrews. Mm, and just goes straight to corporations that didn't <laughs> do anything. Well, that's right. And he... Uh, uh, in the next four years, which Victoria voted for, by the way, in, in the majority, and Liberals lost a lot of ground, you know, we're going to vote for a government that by the end of their tenure in the next four years, we could have doubled our debt, right? And it's okay to have infrastructure and everything like that, but is our debt manageable? Is our debt sustainable? They'll continue to proclaim, yeah, it is, but, you know, it's not a healthy thing that we can just go into debt and, you know, spend our way out of poverty. It's just rubbish. We are... As a country, we're in big, big, big trouble. We are in big trouble economically, legally, and socially as a nation. We need to sort of get together and we need to accept what is in front of us. That is a duty. Because to be honest with him, I don't have to go to fucking uni. Mate, to be honest with you, I'm in a position in life where I can say, fuck Australia. I just live a good life. And if it burns tomorrow, then stiff shit. That's at the age and where I'm at in life. But I'm not thinking like that because it's about my children, my grandchildren's future. Yeah. There is, of course, you can take the selfish approach, but you can't live with yourself. You've, you've no. got, to, got to do this. It's not easy, the life of a patriot nationalist, no. but you feel that that's, that's what you've got to do. You've got yeah. to make sure that because you're seeing what's happening. Yeah. And, and look, I want to make it clear to the audience and that is, this is a fight that I will do, but in a legitimate fashion. Because the system's there for us to use. We've just got to be able to apply ourselves. And it's, and it's not easy. But mate, I, I confess, I went to university this year. You know, I, I passed the stat test. I got in. I never did year 10, 11, and 12 at high school. In the first few months, I spun out, man. It was like, you know, all this academic stuff that I had to do, you know, with essays and lots of things. And I didn't pass a couple of them right but i've gone from struggling with essays to pulling off essays where i'm getting distinctions you know because that's, that's the power of education that's what can be done and and if i can use that qualifications if i can use those talents which i've developed over the next few years and i'll get my law degree i use it to serve my people right because like i said i own my own home i don't have a mortgage I even have an investment property. That's paying itself off. Right? I'm good in life as on a personal basis. But I can't sit back and watch my country burn to the ground right, without voicing opposition. And I can tell you something now. If you think that what's happening in Paris at the moment is not going to come to here, I mean, we're kidding ourselves. We might be a few years behind, right? but it's going to happen here. And it will only happen here if we wait for it to happen. We need to voice our opposition and we need to get professional. We need to get into the system. There's no use complaining that university has been taken over by left-wingers. Isn't there people out there that want to be a university lecturer, for example, who want to teach the next generation the right standards? Isn't there anyone that wants to do that sort of thing? Because that takes sacrifice and duty. Being a public servant is about sacrifice. And I'm hoping that there are people out there that want to do that or at least support people that actually want to do that. 
Going back to the Bendigo activism with the, the UPF uh, opposing the, the mosque, you were called fly-ins, that you weren't really from the area, but I've met the, the Bendigo uh, Patriot activists, they're, they're still there three years on, and the, you were successful. The, the mosque uh, still hasn't been built, uh, mm. that's still, still before the council, so that was something that you were able to impact. Well, look, the way you just stated, that negative came from our political opposition. Now, those who supported us, our job is not to carry Bendigo. My job as a patriot is to inspire others to act. And if our activism and our uh, rallies and, and what we did there actually inspired people to act, to actually voice opposition to government, then we've achieved something. And that's, that's what it's about because... I, ha I feel the burden of responsibility individually to inspire people to, you know what, I can have the courage, I can have the knowledge to stand up. And it's not going to happen overnight, Tim. I've got another four years at uni. That's just an example of the lifelong projection that I have when it comes to serving my nation. I have to get some credentials, I have to gain knowledge, I have to build my individual profile because being 47 years old, and by the time I get my uni degrees, you know, I'll be 51. That is a very good age to actually be in parliament. You know, I'm not old by, by the clock, but I'm not so young that I don't have life experience. Because I've raised a family. I've seen the changes in Australia. I've seen the actual corruption that, that's happening in not only Canberra, but the state governments, a, a, a Victorian police force. And the only way to stand up to that is to actually get involved in the system and know what your rights are. Oh, well, 51, that's still considered young for, for a politician. It'd be a tough task to, to get elected, but if it's something that you want to do, then all the more power to you. Well, if that's a door that may open, I mean, I have to, that's a desire. That certainly is a desire. I think the best way to put it is, is I'm just concentrating now on getting my graduation. I want, I want to get my law degree and Bachelor of Arts degree. Get those two degrees. So I've got a double degree at uni. So the next four years, I've got that focus. What doors open from that experience, it will reveal themselves. But certainly politics, practicing law, some form of activism, and I have that legitimacy behind me, is certainly going to be credentials, which I'm sure I'll be able to help people right, of our nation who have the same concerns as I have. I hope that my experience may inspire others because, you know, Mr. Shorter says he's got a point and make people think, to provoke them to think. And I don't want people to go, oh, you know, look at Chris Shorter, look what he does. Don't be a sheep, you know, criticize me, right? Examine what I say. And if you feel like I've got some merit in it, then act on it. I can't as a person carry people because that's unfortunately what's happened in our movement. We're not collectivists enough compared to the left. Yeah, I don't need to tell me about how the patriot movement hasn't isn't isn't very good at collective or organised activism. Now, mm. your activism in uh, Bendigo it it didn't come without a, a price. You mentioned the the beheading stunt. Uh, mm. your, you, Neil Erickson, and Blair Cottrell were charged under Victoria's Racial and Religious Tolerance Act of offending Muslims, but there yeah. was actually no complaint, and it was the the state government. But yes. before we get into that, now obviously there were more people involved in the the video production than just you three, but you were the three that appeared on camera i just i just thought it was curious that they just decided to focus on the three of you rather uh, than the other people that sort of filmed and helped produce it uh well, that's because we were the, th uh, the three prominent speakers or actors or provocateurs if you like neil was probably more of a provocateur but blair and myself were more prominent speakers and those speakers and, and the words that we stated actually you know, our words were like arrows and they hit their target and the state didn't like it because the state was politically motivated. Now, I'm happy to say that there's been a successful application to the High Court regarding Section 25 of Victoria's Racial Religious Tolerance Act. It's made it there and the High Court's received it and accepted the application and that legislation of the state is going to be tested because it has come with a price. I lost my gun licence. I can't get my security license at the moment because I'm in dispute. And there, there has been a price to be paid because I had the media after me. I had this uh, 
I'll mention this man's name. His name is Luke McMahon. He was a freelance reporter from The Age. And in uh, November 8th, 2015, there was a defamatory article said about me. You know, holy crusader. The three of you, you, Neil Erickson and Blair Cottrell, sort of went your, your separate ways, but you, you all appeared in court together to defend yourselves, represent your, yeah. yourselves, and you put up a, a defence that you believed that you were not guilty of these offences under the, the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act. Yes, yes. Um, that defence involved a, a legal matter. Now, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? That was never going to be just uh, resolved at a magistrate's court. But if I had to took my legal defence with counsel with a half a million bucks, and that is another problem that we have when it comes to law in this land, the amount of justice you get is depending on how big your wallet is. And the unfortunate reality is that the magistrate was always going to rule in favour of the state because if they can't get you via a conviction, right, or if they know that their conviction is shoddy, well, what they'll do, they know that the common man doesn't have money coming out of his backside, right? So the process is, well, if you want to appeal it, take it to a higher court, and it's going to cost you not thousands of dollars, but it's going to cost you tens of thousands of dollars it's going to cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars to try and fight something now when i weighed up the consequences at the end of the 28 day period on which you which i was entitled to appeal i thought to myself for a two thousand dollar fine and a summary conviction i just paid off my house because of my dead mother right because of the inheritance i received i wasn't going to burn that to the ground just for the state Right, because they'll try and get you one way or another, and and I'm not going to allow the state to try and destroy my life either, right? So yeah. that I'm bankrupt or I'm, you know, unable to live a reasonable life. Because if they succeed in doing that, they have victory over you anyway, right? So the fact is, it's before the High Court. John Bolton's the uh, barrister involved, who uh, represented Blair at the County Court and managed to get a stay of proceedings. And we're waiting on it for it to be heard. And I'm good luck to Blair when it comes to that. I hope the High Court rules that Section 25-2 is invalid under the Constitution. Because if it is, the state of Victoria is going to have egg on its face. And I'm going to come along and supply the eggs. <laughs> because the first thing I'll demand is, through legal proceedings is to have that conviction quashed. One summary offence in my 47-year life, and I didn't know it was against the law. Well, that's, that's what's in dispute, right? Because I thought it was in the realms of freedom of expression. And this is where I can get to specific acts. If I go to section 15 and 16 of the Victorian Human Rights Charter, I have the right to freedom of expression, all right? Now, within that right, of course, comes lawful restrictions. That's what they're gonna say, right? as part of that act but that's what we're talking about lawful restrictions under the current law okay and that's not included in section 25 too because if it was it wouldn't be heard at the high court right secondly victoria's legislation under section 24 and 25 i believe through my own research exceeds the authority of federal law now under the constitution when the laws are made by a state which the federal government has already established. They can only make laws that are consistent. Under section 109 of the constitution, it states, when the law of the state is inconsistent with the Commonwealth, the latter shall prevail. And to the extent of the inconsistency, the former will be invalid. Now, if you look at our case, the Bendigo 3, under the federal law, under the Racial Discrimination Act, which does, under the Racial Hatred Act, which is an amendment in 1995, after a memorandum in 1994 in federal parliament, that includes Sikhs, Jews, and Muslims, all right? So Sikhs, Jews, and Muslims can actually use the Racial Discrimination Act, Section 18C. Now, what it requires, though, is that if they make a complaint, they have to go through the Human Rights Commission, which was established in 1986, okay? Now, the whole idea of the Act was to mediate, so if possible, to avoid the court. All right, that's the whole idea of the Racial Discrimination Act. Now, what Victoria did was remove that process. Because there was no complainant, I couldn't mediate. So there's, there's an inconsistency there.
Secondly, I try to subpoena the DPP. This is very important. Now, I put up a legal argument. Even the magistrate recognised it wasn't frivolous. And I've got, ev I've got proof, all right? You see, I've got proof that the DPP's office adjusted their website during the trial because I actually downloaded what was a criteria. You see, there was four points to the criteria at that time to the DPP signing off on Section 25-2 Victoria's Racial and Religious Tolerance Act because Section 24 and Section 25 required the DPP to give authority for that charge to proceed under Victoria's Act. The second and third criteria of the four-part criteria was the impact on the victim. That's why I subpoena. Yeah, That's which, why I, which there was no victim. Th there was no victim. So I wanted to subpoena the Director of Public Prosecutions, and his name was John Champion at the time. He's now a Supreme Court judge. Because oh. I wanted to cross-examine him and ask him, why have you failed to meet the conditions of your criteria? Now, as natural justice should state, in, under our legal system, I've got a right to cross-examine my accuser, whether it is myself or through my legal representation. I was denied that. Blair was denied that. Neil was denied due process. It was totally unfair. That's why we pleaded not guilty. This is outrageous. The state has got offended on behalf of a class of persons. In other words, it's a form of blasphemy law. That is so wrong on so many levels, considering individuals have the right, if they feel vilified, racially discriminated or religiously discriminated against, to actually put a complaint. Because Victoria has its own version of the Human Rights Commission, okay? Right? As Danny and Elias' case of Catch a Fire Ministries yeah, versus... The Victorian the, Human Rights Commission and it, Equal Opportunity Commission, exactly. that's called. Exactly. And it played out and it mirrored federal law so the process was in that sense fair identical Danny and Elia was able to cross-examine through his council the Islamic Council of Victoria because yeah, he had a accusers exactly exactly so he was able to cross-examine uh, test their evidence now John Champion the the DPP now sent his big hot knob lawyer in there say oh well look you know but we won't charge, you know, Mr. Shortest for actually trying to waste John Champion's time or something of that effect. I've got the transcript, oh, right? But the judge, yeah. to his credit, John Hardy, said, well, you wouldn't have been awarded uh, cost anyway. Because at least I felt, from my interpretation of things, that he tried to be fair, John Hardy, the magistrate, right? And he actually saw that m my attempt to subpoena the DPP wasn't misingenuous, right? That I, I put in a genuine reason. But I've got proof they actually changed their website because you cannot find that four-point criteria anymore to the DPP. Yes, I, I definitely suspected at the time that there was a lot of sinister things happening within the Victorian DPP and who, who knows who else was involved as well. Yes. We are lucky that uh, John Bolton has come along and is sort of the, the, the patriot uh, lawyer. He's, he's trying to get the appeal to the, the High Court representing Blair Cottrell and he's also uh, re representing Neil Erickson over the Milo 5 right outside. So well, he's basically retired from normal practice and he, he just does this pro bono. He's a good uh, addition to the movement. I'm hoping to get him on uh, my show to, to go into a bit more detail yeah. about the, the High Court uh, challenge. But from what you've described there, that if the law is applied as it should be, yes. then these holes that you, you just described, the High Court should notice all of these and if they because they rule against the government all the time they they should be quite scathing in yeah. if this case is heard that this yes. is what the the dpp uh, did wrong you were denied due process at the trial look i'm not sure what attack john bolton because he's, he's got the copy of the transcripts which i bought i actually bought the transcripts of the trial because i need it for my future what is i hope future legal practice the bottom line is he is a good man and, and he's very brave and I really, I can't thank him enough for actually doing this because he doesn't have to. Mm. Right? He doesn't have to. He's, he's, in, he's like me in life. Well, I could just let Australia burn and live a good life. Who cares? But to actually want to make that sacrifice and to stand by for a matter of principle, you know, I think John Bolton is an honourable man. So, you know, God bless him for that. I hope to get the training that I need over the next four years and get my double 
degree in Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Law so that I in turn can be qualified to actually represent people or at least have the credential to run for politics, whatever the doors that may open. So look, it's that's what I'm talking about, our movement. We've got to, the street stuff does not work. It really doesn't. Now, the Bendigo stunt, those occasional stunts can be useful, right, to gain a political momentum, to turn a political wheel, to get awareness out there. But look, we're just normal people, right? And we, we probably, to my disappointment, we didn't capitalise on on this issue because street stunts at the moment and the stuff that's happening on the street is only serving the state it doesn't matter what side you're on if you're on the left hand side or you're on the right hand side of politics right and you're doing your street bullshit it's only serving the state because they're coming up with the idea look you know society's getting restless these protests are getting out of hand we need to make more laws and give more powers to the police we don't want to give powers more powers to the police they already look like bloody swat Big poll there, they keep getting their, their powers beefed up. Yes, yes, and this is something that we can do. Like, for example, there's already laws that have been around since 1958 in Victoria regarding public order, right? And it's under the Victorian Crimes Act, 1958, right? Section 20 and 21, right? You can be charged, it's an indictable offence that can give you good jail time. You can be charged for threats to kill and threats to cause grievous bodily harm, um, and there's obviously related charges to that. There's a litany of charges, and even 321G of the Victoria's Crimes Act is called the laws of incitement. Now, they'll add incitement, and then they'll add, you know, threats to kill, or if you're, you know, charged with those laws. And these are all indictable offences. And it's not like the police don't have law as it is now. Unfortunately, what's happening is, is that we're attacking an area where it involves freedom of expression. To counterbalance the fact that we have racial discrimination laws, we actually have laws, like I mentioned before, from the Human Rights Commission about freedom of expression. We can associate with anybody that we want, right? You know, we're not compelled to be part of a, a organization or association, but we have the right to join an association or a group, political group, religious group, whatever, right? Freedom of association. Under federal law, we've actually got something called Section 28 of the Crimes Act, 1914. Now, if we're doing legitimate politics, and this is where I sort of, you know, I've seen RV Emini and Neil harass those that are at polling booths, they could yeah. have been arrested under Section 28 of the Crimes Act. I, I definitely think when you move into the field of harassment, I mean, yes, it's, it's entertaining and people watch, yeah. but is it productive i mean in avi's case has he got 0.5 percent of the yeah. vote yeah and look he only got 0.5 percent of the vote because the bastard was lazy right he was too busy gallivanting overseas uh you know worshipping his idol tommy robertson because he speaks out against islam right where he should have been for months i mean i'm not talking about just four weeks out before the yeah, state yeah. election he should have been out campaigning and putting across alternate policy to benefit victoria so he wasn't serious about the politics so he actually by his actions has actually mocked the system that we have which the system itself is not corrupt it's people who corrupt use it for corrupt purposes there's a difference you see because if you look at the laws and if you look at the statutes right laws and statutes are only created by people who refer to a constitution victoria has its own constitution australian politics australia as a nation has its own constitution and laws and acts are derived from those things now it can be done righteously and lawfully or corruptly but you can't blame a system itself right what's wrong with our society is not the laws and statutes that are necessarily written particularly the constitution it's actually people and their their, their wrong mindset and they need to get out of this oh but we need to change the system because you can change the system all you want but if the people's mindset is incorrect you're going to have the same problem doesn't matter what system that you have. It's just that our system, if exercised morally and exercised justly, right, it's better than anything that's ever existed in history. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of law and constitutional law which is sitting idle. That's not yes. just with Australia, it's also overseas. Now, obviously, it, ta it talked about you don't like the, the stunts and that's part of the, the reason why you 
and Neil Erickson parted ways. Yes. You're now involved with the Australia First Party, which is, I, I would call it a, a white nationalist um, party. Yep. So you're an active member of that. They also have their media outlets, UNA Media. Uh, why is Australia First the, the answer in your opinion? Well, if you're a nationalist, Thanks we're a registered political party. We've got our policy. We've got policy on immigration, economics, everything. Right? And obviously, history and is a big teacher. Show. And Don't we need to, to um, actually defend what is our heritage. Because whether people like it or not, the, right, the Constitution, everything that we have, the freedoms that we have today, they were made by white men. Right? And, you know, we're in today, we're in an age where we have progressive politicians and this is the oxymoron because nearly all progressives are white people that seem to have the you know sackcloth and ashes attitude regarding their own race so they're too busy being apologetic for everything else in the world right because of the so-called evils that we've done we should be defending our heritage now i don't apologize for admitting that i'm a white nationalist now a lot of people think oh but he's a white nationalist he hates other people i don't hate anyone at all right i can get along with people that are not white yeah, if you actually understand properly what white nationalism is, it's not white supremacy. Well, white nationalism has its schisms. Now, in the context of Australia, because nationalism must relate to the individual country, all right? If we look at history accurately, white men are is just as disloyal to each other as any other race on the face of the earth. I mean, the French and English were killing each other for centuries. They're genetically identical right okay germany and france you know european scots and english you know irish and english and so forth right so it's not like you know we had the vikings in the seventh century invade england you know and then they had a northern crusade in the 10th century whatever right so it's not like white men has ever been you know super loyal to one another because you know of the various tribalism that existed in that day so when i talk australian nationalism i talk about australian nationalism in the context of our history we became our own breed of man, right, through the colonies and then finally Federation. Our troops that served in World War One and World War Two were a different breed of men than the, well, I mean, our heritage, obviously, our beginnings came from Britain and Europe. It's more Anglosphere at the time, right? But we became our own breed of men. And to be honest with you, right, I love Europe and England because I went to England for its history and everything like that. But really, Europe, I don't have any loyalty to Europe. That continent, right, has shed the blood of two generations of my countrymen, right, for them, because that's been a hellhole for despots and tyrants in Europe. And just look at the state it's in now. Exactly. And it's all because they revert to that old attitude, which is ingrained into European. And to be quite frank with you, right, the Western, the modern Western nations, which came out of what was the Protestant Reformation, by the way, you know, if, England as a power base. We colonised the quarter of the globe, right? Now, no nation's perfect on the face of the earth, but it carried with it, obviously, its heritage from Magna Carta and then Protestant Christianity, which has a bit of a separation and church and state concept. And we made nations, you know, imperfect before God, of course, but we made countries, when you compare them to others, more fair, more just than other nations on the face of the earth. I mean... I'll put it to you another way. I'll, I'll, I'll get, be a bit of a context. Why should I be lectured by any yellow man regarding human rights? Just go to China. Just ask the Dalai Lama how you know good and tolerant the Chinese are when it comes to human rights. Right? Whether you're a Christian, Muslim, or a bloody Buddhist, just ask them. They're really they're really tolerant people. Well, I'm going to have a Asian man lecture me regarding human rights. Us white man, you all racist. Look, you know what? Go f yourself. Right. I'm not going to be lectured by anyone like that. Well, we shouldn't need to be lectured by any people about, you know, wow, what we've done wrong throughout history yes. or whatever. You know, we know what's what's right and wrong. Yes. We, we know uh, our history. That's, that's enough for us. Well, I mean, I'll put it to you an ultimate way. It's to do with an ideology that we developed, and it was to do with the Protestant Reformation. But what race on the face of the earth fought wars to free slaves? Only whites. 
So don't come lecturing my race on how bad we are at human rights when we're the only ones that fought for other races so that they could be free and have liberty too. So you know what? For all these so-called lefties who want to rent their garments and go, oh, how bad we are because left, because of our whiteness and all that sort of thing, where's the sackcloth and ashes? Mate, go away and crawl under a rock, all right? We done in history. History is covered by three words, accurately. The good, the bad, and the ugly. That's how you, the three words that describe history, right? We've all sold slaves. We've all committed genocide of some sort. We've all committed acts of horror. But we've all done good things. But white man, we've actually fought to free others. To free others, right? Long after the American Civil War. <laughs> and others who weren't like us. Yeah, well, just remember, blacks weren't taken by force into slavery into America, right? They were sold by their own black chieftains. Don't let it, the truth get in the way of a good story, okay? Not only that, the Arabs world is still selling blacks today, right? In the Middle East. Yeah, and just look at how in Qatar and those United Arab Emirates, how they treat the, the Filipino guest workers. They're all dying there. Exactly, and this is the real irony about the West at the moment. It's so self-loathing and self-condemning of its own conduct, yet it fails to recognize or completely ignores the conduct of other nations, whether it be China, whether it be, you know, Burma, right, whether it be Africa itself. I mean, we've seen things which we would find absolutely barbaric. And we're not even talking about, you know, in Africa, for example, you know, black against another color. We're talking about two different tribes. They're both black. Was it the Tutsis and the Hutus or whatever yeah, in it was Rwanda. in Rwanda. I mean, for Christ's sake, this self-loathing of the West, we are actually, there's no such thing to me as white genocide. There's only white suicide because we're doing it to ourselves. We are absolutely doing it to ourselves, right? We're not bloody, you know, we're allowing it. We're, we're just sitting back and say, oh yeah, you know, look, oh, look at our human rights record. Oh, woe is me, you know, let's look after everyone else. And I've got a question to these lefties regarding refugees, okay, because I'm not left or right, okay? We shouldn't be involved in wars which create refugees in the first place, but I'd like to put it to these lefties, okay? Shouldn't we invest in a humanitarian sense the tools and the know-how to actually make Africa great and the countries that are in it? I did casual work and I had two Kenyan men work with me. These were fine men. They weren't even here to live. They actually were just here to get educated. And I'm all for that, for a humanitarian purpose. They were learning skills to take back to their country to make their nation great as a term of reference, right? And I was so warmed by that fact. Why can't we go to these countries? Right? Why can't we assist as humanitarians and say, look, you don't need to live here. Why can't you make your... There's, there's exotic places in Africa that are mind-blowing. It's not like there's nothing there that they couldn't be proud of. I could go to China. There's places there that exist that are mind-blowing. Right? There's no need to Chinese for to come here. That's probably where I differ. I mean, if a Chinese person or an African person yeah. likes Australia, makes a great contribution, is an upstanding citizen... Yep. I have no problem with that. Look, the principle that you aspire, right, I disagree with it for one reason. Is it because if there was a choice and a set of circumstances in the world and some world order decided to say, okay, everyone's got to return to their place of ethnicity, right? I can't even go back to England. England is overrun by third world hordes. London, mate, I went to London. It's like I was having a joke when I went to England. Other people said, look, I'm more English than the English, right? So... Our white nations, which they're not, are entitled to be homogenous in their setting. Because the very the reason why non-whites come to this country, because they see the lifestyle. They see the economic opportunity, for example. Right? I said, why is it that they can't create that economic lifestyle and every opportunity in their own nation? Because let's look at Africa. <laughs> Africa is probably what? You can fit, what, 10 Australias in it? Right, it's massive the land, yeah. right? So I, I can't understand, right? When we came here as colonists, right? Australia was made up of hundreds and hundreds of tribes of Aboriginals, which can't make claim to the land because it is against their culture and religion. They were nomadic. 
and Aboriginal tribes fought amongst themselves. Yeah, yeah. Br- I, brutal. I right? It was brutal. It, it was, but I mean, it's notwithstanding that the worst thing that white man did when he came here was unfortunately we we brought our colds and flus, and that probably had the biggest impact on Aboriginal populations more than anything, right? And as white men, I mean, I think I believe in a personal sphere, right, that we should have a treaty. We should have a treaty, and that's white man's responsibility. I accept that, right? I've actually drafting up a treaty because of obviously the studies I'm doing at uni. But why should we as a nation, right? Because if I go to Point Cook, for example, right, it looks like bloody India. Countering your argument, right, it's not that these people are not nice or anything like that. It's got nothing to do with it because they're probably nice. Most Indians are moral and just people and they just want to keep to themselves and everything like that, right? But if you were to use the historical context of our forefathers and if you were to observe their statements, what our forefathers envisioned for our nation and what I see as an Australian, I go to Point Cook and it's like I'm a foreigner in my own country because it doesn't matter how much you know, nice people they are. They're not Australian. Australian, by definition, is white and it was for seven decades after Federation. Why do they say, oh, we ended the white Australia policy if that wasn't the intent of our forefathers? I mean, no one can answer that, right? Now, I'm pragmatic to ex- understand that the circumstances now that obviously there's a lot of non white Australians that live here. So the next best step now, right, while we deal with an immigration policy, is to actually, hang on, we have Australian law and we enforce Australian law. I definitely think that no matter what the racial makeup of the country, that Australian law sure should always prevail the way it has been throughout uh, history. Mm. But the problem is, and this is the reason why I have a bias against multiculturalism, is because we haven't. We've actually capitulated bit by bit our laws and our standards to accommodate people that don't respect our culture. And therefore, by definition, with all these racial discrimination laws, which started in 1975, that's the, that was the creation of it, because it was from then that we started being multicultural or multiracial, both, um, that we started to undermine our own system. And the racial discrimination laws and its state equivalents, some states are shocking. WA is apparently really shocking. Victoria is shocking because of my own personal experience, is the consequence of having to police a multicultural society. We're not equal under the law anymore. And federally speaking, I can't even use the Racial Discrimination Act because I'm white and because, you know, in academia it says, oh, because you're the majority ethnic group. That is actually fact. That's what the law says? That's what the act says, right? If you discuss the context of the memorandum they had in 1994, right, because the Racial Hatred Act of 1995 was an amendment to the Racial Discrimination Act. It tells you that we're not talking about white people. We're talking about minority groups. Now, as a Seventh-day Adventist, I'm more of a minority than Jews, right, in this country. (laughs) There's more Jews in this country than Seventh-day Adventists, so I am a minority in that context. But as a white fellow, right, I was told this at university and I had a disagreement with the teacher at university in the first semester this year that you can't be racist towards white men, right? They were her words, mm-hmm. right? Because we're the majority ethnic group. That's what's getting around at left-wing academia. I've well, seen the logical conclusion of that type of attitude uh, in South Africa. Well, exactly. But the problem is, most of the problems, because you've got to remember things like Islam or African gangs and all that sort of stuff. It's just a symptom of what left-wing aristocratic mindset does, right? Because the argument since colonization of this nation you know whether it be the eureka stockade the buckland river uprising the lambing flats the shearer strike of 1891 they all had a common denominator right because white man is divided into two classes you have the aristocrat and you have the working class and i don't want to sound like you know working class in a in a marxist sense because they're called the bourgeois right but there was and i consider that like the middle class you know people that can actively engage earning a living and everything like that and the government institutions providing wages and conditions right now that's still happening today there's so many aristocratic whites or at least that mindset who won't hire their own countrymen but they'll hire you know non-whites because they know that they can pay them less that's the whole idea the chinese the lambing flats was a classic example the riots against the chinese because the the white aristocrats wanted cheap labor so that they can increase their profits 
at the expense of their other white fellows. And that's this story is still playing out now. I mean, Gina Reinhardt, have you read her attitude about wages and conditions? Well, yeah, she, she says that Australians, you need to get a better work ethic because Africans can work for $2 a day. And what does that tell you? Well, that tells that she's going to employ who's going to provide her with the best value. Exactly, because her mindset is completely capitalist, without any moral compass, without any thought for a fellow countryman. Now, look, on the flip side, there is some truth to the fact that, unfortunately, the reason why you see Indians in car washes and, and, and all that sort of stuff is simply because there are Australians, even though they're on the dole, they won't work in a car wash. There is some truth to that, for example, right? But that does not mean that we throw out the bay with the bathwater and that we bring in third world labor you know and a lot of it's through four five seven visas or the modern equivalent because i think they amended the legislation on that and because it's an attack on wages and conditions and wages and conditions have been stagnant the top one percent are still romping it in you know and you know this is where i'm not a capitalist by virtue of not being a pure capitalist it, it still needs safeguards right yes we need capitalism we can't have the government control absolutely everything but there are certain things that the government should absolutely have control over now australia first uh, you believe that that's uh, the best party for nationalists but yep. the two le or main people in the party uh, they're sort of seen as yesterday's people jim salim and nathan sykes and the the una website it does do a lot of what people term punch right and there's already quite a enough division in the in the patriot movement we've already established that united patriots front dissolved so can you reflect on that the thing i'll say about that is that every young generation that comes up amongst the ranks thinks that the elders if you like have had their day right it's probably increased more that our generation, it doesn't matter what political ilk you are, seems to have an inherent disrespect for those who have basically lived a life, right? None of these young people that are patriots are saying that Jim Salem's too old and all that sort of stuff. And I'm not accusing anyone directly, but just think about what you're saying. You've never owned your own home, right? You've never raised a family. I've raised a family, right? I am my own home, life experience. And instead of saying those sort of things, you should reflect. And secondary to that about the divisions or the so-called divisions there's too many groups amongst the civic patriot type that wants to call themselves nationalists you can't do that you're stealing a principle of what true australian nationalism is right and call yourself civic patriots call what you want but don't call yourself nationalists and you know with neil erickson he one stage called uh, oh, nationalist uprising and at the same time supporting Israel. Well, those two don't go together for a start, right? And really, Australian nationalism, by virtue of its historical context, you cannot be multiracial, all right? Because I know, I accept as a white man that we're now become a minority group, and that's obviously the politics will, and obviously my political endeavours will adjust to that. But we also live in a society where it's like, to a certain extent you ever heard of sticks and stones plenty of shit has been said about me and i'm getting on with it instead of having a big sook fest about it and breaking down oh yeah but you know there has been and everything like that i say to the opposition well your has nots because you haven't done fucking anything in life all right and i would challenge them to just take wisdom learn learn of our history right dialogue can always improve i i accept that right but at the same time if people call you names or they say something about you it's like have a cup of concrete at the same time you know what i mean because it's not like i've you know whinged and wailed and had a nervous breakdown because the states come after me what i've done is gone well you've called me this sort of thing so i'm going to take you on i've paid a price okay fair enough right and i'll probably continue to pay a certain price because of my activism and i'm willing to do that for the sake of the patriots and i and i say to the patriots too and it's a, it's a general thing it's a new phenomenon with social media for example because i'm an old hat i lived at a time where when i was a teenager we didn't play xbox and all that sort of stuff and be stuck to a mobile phone and all that sort of stuff that's why i have an ipad that doesn't even have mobile internet is because we used to ride our bmx's go and kick the footy or play cricket at the cricket nets for a couple of hours that's what we did when we were kids right so i'm generationally different because of that but people need to say 
have a cup of concrete, realize what social media does, because we've all been trapped into it, I included, right? It sort of draws you in because it's something relatively new when it comes to technology and we need to take a back seat back. Don't be so reactive. Let's think about things and try and do what I've discussed. Be more intellectual, learn of knowledge and apply that knowledge in a proper activist way when we can take on the state. Now, what's risen out of the United Patriots Front is the, the Lad Society, which was founded by Tom Sewell, yep. Blair Cottrell's associated with it. Yep. It's a white nationalist organisation, so it'd be what you consider a proper nationalist organisation. What is, and it's trying to build a community. What's, what's your opinion on what they're, what they're doing? I actually like what they're doing. I actually like what they're doing. I've got no issue with it whatsoever. I've spoken to Tom recently and we had a very good conversation and I think he's, for a young man, he's got a very good head on his shoulders and th and, and that head on his shoulders is only going to continue to grow and expand and, and become better as he matures because, you know, I look at myself when I was his age and I can't say that I was even as good as that. You know, he's got a plan and I like it as a young man and it's a human condition. You know, he'll probably make a couple of mistakes on the way, right? But in principle, I really support what he's doing. I think it, it's something to be admired because he's doing something at a grassroots level. And uh, I, I absolutely have no issue with it whatsoever. One video you did make recently was attacking toxic masculinity and you attack, oh, I shouldn't say attack, but you criticized Blair Cottrell and Neil Erickson. Blair Cottrell, after he appeared on Sky, made a tweet where he said, I may as well have raped Laura Jays on air and then there was another one where it was an advertisement for a, a girls school where they said girls unstoppable and he said except walking through parks at night and Neil Erickson has become quite friendly with actually goes to to court with Andy Nolk who's yeah. the man who vandalized uh, Yuri Dixon's memorial the girl who was murdered walking home at night so so do you think that this sort of anti-feminist attitude in the, the the patriot movement is not helpful feminism is cancer as in what we see right out in their society but reflecting your question is that nationalists are supposed to represent a creed of gentlemen have your masculinity i certainly have it right i work out i'm 47 years old and you know and uh, i love the feeling of strength and all that sort of thing but our women are our heroes right they're the mother of our children Right, they're our aunts, they're our grandmothers, they're our daughters, for crying out loud, right? You've got to be a gentleman, right? And the reason why I criticise it is because our movement gets shit canned enough as it is. Now, the left, in their deceit, try to can it, like to say, see, this is what happens in the patriot movement. They're not exactly free from misogyny themselves, okay? They are yeah. not. I mean, just ask Mel Gregson, for example, when a few years ago, you know, with the Victorian socialists and the big falling out that they have because uh, of the attitudes just there. Just look at uh, what's happened with the Greens. Exactly. The election. I exactly. Because there's certain attitudes, and this separates the general gentleman from just misogynist if you like right is that you know there are men out there that treat women like shit let's call it as it is right men are superiorly stronger they have more aggression right you know my wife and i we go to gym you know we'll do a workout you know help me babe she'll bench press 20 25 kilos mate here i go boom 100 <laughs> can you see what i mean right you know she I put her weight and I just press it above my shoulders like 70 bloody kilos, right? She's not as heavy as that. And I do boom, 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 right? The bottom line is, if she punches me in the face, she'll probably give me a bloody nose, right? If I punched her in the face as hard as I could, she's dead. Or at least in a coma. You can't compare. And if you look at the statistics of crime, there's nothing wrong with acknowledging the fact that men are more inherently violent. But you know what? Gentlemen don't give in to those base passions. Gentlemen resist that, right? And gentlemen will use their strength for good because using the two-edged sword trick from a misogynist bastard who treats women like shit, you go to the gentleman, right, who wards off attackers because of his superior strength, right, and aggression and uses it to protect his wife and children. The strength and aggression itself is not a bad thing it's how it's applied because the flip-flop is and this is what feminazis refuse to understand is that a woman wants to feel protected 
a woman wants to feel wanted. Now, if you protect the woman, you're willing to get into a dust up because of an aggressor, right? Who's defiling her honor and you're willing to defend your wife. That is something that's in a gentleman instinctual. I've been with my wife 21 years. We have a great relationship, intimacy, the whole lot. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. I'm in life. I cannot complain, right? On a personal level. Because I know how to treat a woman. My Christian faith obviously teaches that. She's got to love me. It even The Bible even says, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. But husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So I've got to give myself to my wife. She, she's not my servant. She's my equal. right? And from a Genesis point of view, mate, God took a rib from Adam's side. Because my wife is at my side. She's not beneath me. She's not above me. But she's at my side. That's the way it works. Right? True gentlemen understand this concept. Doesn't sacrifice their manhood. Actually, it only enhances their manhood. Does the opposite. Doesn't sacrifice their strength or their masculinity. But that's true masculinity. When you love your wife and you know that... Because women have certain gifts. Women can do things better than a man. But men can do things better than a woman. We, we're created differently. But we complement one another. That's the true relationship between a man and a woman. Right? And when they made these videos... You know, and the, the, the utter disrespect. Well, it's no wonder you're single. You don't have children. You don't. You haven't fucking raised a family. Of course, you don't know. But if you find out and start submitting yourself to what is right, well, you'll have these things. That's a good way of explaining it. Now we've talked about obviously Australia first, lad society, and then yep. ox convicts and <laughs> and Neil Erickson. In regard to your definition of what a nationalist is, what do you think the the movement has to do as a whole to advance? The whole movement, on one breath, has to be more pragmatic. Okay, now you can be pragmatic as in, you know, I personally believe there's going to be alliances that are going to be formed. But within that inner circle of those groups, like Australia First, for example, we're never going to surrender our political ideology. Never. But in pragmatist terms, right, I'm going to work with others because my enemy is not those who don't have the same beliefs that I do. They may believe in most things that I believe in. But there's obviously, like you and I, you, we and I agree on most things, but we don't agree on absolutely everything, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. My enemy is the state. It's the establishment. That's who I want to go after. That's who the patriots need to focus on, right? And it's through doing things like, for example, I've got an idea that I'll come up when I start forming my own live feed radio, right? Or, or videos through YouTube. And that is going to become a collective. Even if it's in a way, I've, I'll suggest an idea if you don't mind, right? That idea is, is that as a collective, we all need to come together. I'm going to set up a bank account. This is my intent to set up a bank account. I want a professional to be a co-signatory and that account is only used for legal purposes right everyone who makes a donation supplies their email and they get a monthly bank statement to see where it grows right and this pool of money which is only used for one thing legal purposes will be used by patriots and we're going to start okay what battles can we win through the high court to peg back power from the state and if not the federal government we just have to do a search and find and examine this we need to get together like that because a true understanding of our governance now while we still got it we don't want to become a republic trust me on this while we still got the established government via our constitution the powers are divided between the cabinet executive and the judiciary the judiciary is on the side of law right as a group because obviously if we find something look this needs to be challenged because it's unconstitutional we have proper legal representation we challenge say victoria section 25 which is before the High Court. Now, that's an example of what we can do as a group. But we need, to, we need to continually donate money to this pool so that we can have the financial resources to mount a legal challenge against the state. Now, I put it to people. If you're willing to pay idiots that come over from America, like Milo, Lauren Southern, Stephen Melieu, whatever his name is, right, who gallivant around the world and took general terms how the West is great, well, who cares, right? And then they have this lifestyle flying all over the world. Well, why don't you put in a pool of money, right, into an account so that would go to legal representation to take on a state when they've created an unjust law which is unconstitutional, right? 
because it's specific to Australia. There's no use following these people that are, you know, gallivanting around the world saying, oh, the West is great. No, what we need to do is understand how our own individual system works, has similarities to America and Canada and that, but we have our own parliament, we have our own set of laws. We need to start learning how our country operates and start using the system in our favour. It's going to take time, it's going to take sacrifice, most of all it's going to take dedication. But if we do not do it, if we do not start pulling together and go, okay, I want to study the constitution, I want to study certain things, I'm willing to try and help out people wherever they can, right? But I'm going to be repeating this message over Christmas and the New Year and try and formulate a way where we can build a financial pool and get groups together and say, look, there's a law here that affects all of us. It affects our freedom of expression and we believe this is unconstitutional. With proper legal advice, where can we go with this? Can we take on the state? Because the judiciary is separate from the government. Well, it's supposed to be. <laughs> and we can only pray to God it is. And, you know, the, the, the result of John Bolton's application to the High Court is going to be very interesting because I'd like to see how that pans out because we've got to do something, but we've got to do something that is effective. We've got to do something that's legitimate because if we get into proper politics, this is the reason why I'm involved in Australia First, right? You are protected by law. See, Neil Erickson and Arby Yemeni could have been arrested and charged under Section 28 of the Crimes Act. They were effectively, in my view, if I was a copper, a Fed, I would have charged them with Section 28 of the Crimes Act because they have violated other people's right for political discourse through harassment. That was dumb. That was dumb as dog shit. And I can't understand why people follow RV Yemeni. That was absolutely dumb. It's not a question of asking them questions and putting them on the spot. They were there exercising their political right and duty by manning booths for an election and you harassed him that's against the law neil erickson doing the same thing that is against the law you want to be you want to wear you know dumb fuck on your forehead that's up to you but at the end of the day that's it's not good for the movement you're kicking goals to the opposition by doing that sort of shit and that's why i oppose it because we've got to be proper well, the legal fund, it's definitely a great idea, and if there's one thing that the, the Patriot Nationalist movement needs, it's more organisation, yeah. better, better structure, so yes. all the best to you for that, and thanks today for, for coming in for this extended chat, so me and my audience can get to know you and your ideas and plans a, lot, a whole lot better. Well, stay tuned because there will be a, a live feed that I'll set up for next year. Stay tuned on my channels. And I do appreciate you, Tim, for inviting me on your show. And, and thank you very much for giving me a voice for a little while. Thank you. My pleasure. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Voting for our 2018 annual Unshackler Awards is closing soon. All 10 award categories have been posted. Each category has 10 nominees in each, and the winners will be announced on Australia Day by our senior editor, Damien Ferry. Make sure you go to the unshackled.net slash unshackler awards to cast your vote. As everyone is slowly getting back to work, we have three major Australian tours happening in February. There is the Deplorables Tour, which still hopes to feature Gavin McGuinness, Tommy Robinson and Milo Yiannopoulos, which is hosted by Penthouse Australia. There is Dr. Jordan B. Peterson's return to Australia with special guest Dave Rubin. And Dr. Stephen Hicks is having his first visit to Australia, which is hosted by True Arrow Events. Remember that it takes us a lot of time and money to produce the content and operate the Unshackled. We cannot do this without the support of our followers, especially in this age of deplatforming and when we are under close watch by the enemies of our agenda, you can still pledge at our Patreon at patreon.com slash the unshackled and directly via our PayPal link, which is paypal.me slash the unshackled. We also have a premium membership option on our website, which is the unshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership. We are also looking at opening up cryptocurrency support options as it is money that supports free speech. Another way to support our work is by buying some right-thinking merchandise over at uprightmarket.com. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net. And keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.